What's a very disturbing fact that almost nobody knows? Story 1. Organophosphates, including the chemical weapon sarin gas, work by inhibiting your muscles' ability to relax. Your muscles basically constrict and can't unconstrict, causing what feels like a muscle cramp through your entire body. Your arms, your chest, your eyes, your tongue, everything. It most frequently ends someone's life via asphyxiation because you can't exhale. Surviving means a permanent, irrecoverable loss of motor function even with rapid medical treatment. To further explain, your body transmits nerve signals by way of synapses, gaps between your nerves across which chemicals called neurotransmitters are sent. The neurotransmitter for muscle contraction is called acetylcholine. When your body wants to contract a muscle, it releases acetylcholine from the transmitting neuron, which then binds to the receiving neuron. So long as it's there, the neuron will keep sending contract signals. Now the way this stops is through an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which collects the bound acetylcholine, removing it from the receiving neuron and returning it to the transmitting one for reuse. Sarin works by basically breaking acetylcholinesterase, preventing its function. Your body can't reuptake acetylcholine anymore and things stop functioning correctly. Acetylcholinesterase isn't something your body can easily make more of, so once you lose some, you're never getting it back. It's worth noting that motor function loss isn't like the body part is permanently flexed, it's not rigor mortis. Rather, lasting effects cause delayed muscle reactions and potential tremors. And while this is happening, you'll also be taking a whiz and a dump while vomiting. Now, the way we're taught to remember the Toxidrome collection of poison symptoms of organophosphates is sludge. Salivation, lacrimation, crying, urination, diaphoresis, sweating, GI upset, taking a crap, and emesis, vomiting. All of these body functions are controlled by muscarinic receptors. These little guys receive signals from the brain to do all the stuff I just mentioned, except in a controlled fashion. Organophosphates just turn off the stop control. You also don't need too much of it. As a nerve gas, sarin in its purest form is estimated to be 26 times more potent than cyanide. The lethal dose to 50% of test subjects of subcutaneously injected sarin in mice is 172 micrograms per kilogram. Now, sarin is highly toxic whether by contact with the skin or breathed in. The lethal concentration of sarin in the air is approximately 28 to 35 milligrams per cubic meter per minute for a two-minute exposure time by a healthy adult breathing normally. It's also odorless and colorless, so if you put it in an empty glass, hundreds of people nearby and downwind will perish from merely inhaling the vapors. Story 2. There are 21 to 46 million slaves living right now. In Mauritania, 4% of the population is enslaved. That means about 160,000 slaves. In India, the enslaved population is about 8 million or 0.6% of the population. My wife worked with an organization that worked on helping them in India. She said the stories she got were way too disturbing and usually coupled with the old trade and maltreatment of children. She couldn't do it for too long. Some of the few she witnessed were bonded labor, labor among minors, human trafficking, forced begging, basically some a-holes using people who don't have any other option. This is one of the reasons you should never give any money if you see some child begging on the street. He or she is being told to do that. Because you're encouraging that kind of behavior, always give food instead. Story 3. In 1977, the average life expectancy in Cambodia was 18.91 years. That's because the Khmer Rouge ended anyone who wore glasses or a watch. For them, it meant they knew how to read and therefore were bad intellectuals. The Khmer Rouge also assumed you weren't a simple peasant farmer. Now, during those times, to save on ammunition, the Khmer Rouge used to innocent ones and parents who were made to watch this. Actually, the Khmer Rouge ended anyone, but wearing glasses did make things certain. It was a communist movement and a hostile takeover, but it was not in and of itself communism. The Khmer Rouge emerged as a major power, taking Phnom Penh in 1975 and later carrying out the Cambodian from 1975 until 1979, when they were ousted by Vietnam and Vietnamese-backed People's Republic of Kampuchea, supported by the Soviet Union in the Cambodian-Vietnamese War. Pol Pot was a pretty radicalized nut job that ended up losing the support of his own Khmer Rouge party. He was exiled to Thailand before it all ended and when Cambodia did start practicing a form of democratic elections, the Communist Party won and has been winning since. 
North Vietnam was also a communist state but didn't target intellectuals. The Soviet leaders in Moscow often said of Ho Chi Minh that its problem was that it was Vietnamese first and then a communist. Now, for some reason, knowing about this population data just made me very uncomfortable. But this is nothing compared to the population data in Story 6. It's super messed up. Story 4. Encephalitis lethargica causes you to slowly survive, but not live. After bouts of deep sleep where patients can be woken very easily but fall immediately back into deep sleep, they're left with post-encephalitis symptoms. The main one being that their minds are fully aware and conscious, but they cannot physically function. It's like a bit like locked-in syndrome, and they display extreme apathy. They even know they're displaying apathy but can't express any emotions, so they're completely stuck until someone throws a ball at them, which they can then immediately catch, or until someone holds their hand and walks alongside them, then they can suddenly walk. Otherwise, nothing. It's so bizarre. Encephalitis, in many of its forms, has a lot of similarities to functional movement or neurological disorder. In some places, this is called conversion disorder, sometimes shortened as FMD or FND. When I was hospitalized with FND, I had catatonia, dystonia, dyskinesia, and akinesia for very long spells. Unforgettable were people handing me things to test if my brain was still operating and giving me instructions to attempt to activate the motor cortex. My spouse reported to me that I would take defensive actions to stop some things from hurting me, like a nurse walking up to me with frustration by using an outward stop hand gesture, but I don't have any visual memories of these externally induced behaviors. According to my doctors, FMD is something that occurs in genetic development but can get activated for all sorts of reasons like trauma or illness. So if it happens to you all of a sudden, like tomorrow, I hope you have help and are able to ASAP. Part of FMD is that the flight, fight, and freeze parts of the brain can hijack the motor cortex. Among its many symptoms, two of which are very problematic are my body can begin to suddenly flee all at once, and my body can stop like a mannequin. For example, when most people are startled by something, they lean away, their eyes close, and then widen as an automatic response. They may bring their hands up towards their faces in fear and surprise, yell or freeze or move away from the source of their fear. That being said, if you have FMD during the routine of the conditioned behaviors, the part of the brain that is based on logical context choices, the prefrontal cortex, is no longer in command. Instead, the motor cortex for the body is running the procedure of the conditioned behavior, namely the reaction you have to fear and surprise. In my case, that is to flee or freeze, and once that starts, I'm not in control of my body at all. I take about 30 pills a day in medications and prescribed supplements that, if I miss, I'll be unable to walk within a few hours and catatonic shortly after walking ceases. I rely very much on my spouse to live. If they weren't alive, I would be in a state medical home for adults and likely in the memory care unit due to my accidental flight risk. On top of that, I also get a lot of general malaise from people who have never seen me alone in several years, mainly since I must always have a caregiver with medical power of attorney privileged in case I go full catatonic. In the worst cases, my caregivers become a legal shield to instruct medical providers when some disturbing or competitive person wants to make an issue out of my lack of movement when I become motor cortex hijacked in the general vicinity of them. I can't imagine what this dude goes through when he gets his episodes being there but not really present. That's got to be tough. Story 5. It used to be believed that babies as old as 15 months couldn't feel pain. As a result, doctors would perform surgery without anesthesia. Doctors use muscle relaxants on the infants to prevent squirming, essentially paralyzing the babies for the duration of the procedure. Now, how long ago was this? Reports indicate that this continued up until the 1980s. A lot of people still believe they can't feel pain the same way as adults. Circumcisions are still done on newborns without any real anesthesia. The numbing cream doesn't even do anything and the numbing shots are rarely given enough time to even help because people think when they cry it's just instinctual and not out of pain. Interestingly, enough studies are coming out saying babies actually feel more pain than adults. And MRIs done on newborns after circumcision show severe trauma in the brain. The day my first son was born five years ago, my dad took me aside and asked if we were having him circumcised. 
I had already decided that there was no way I would allow it, but he looked very relieved and told me that when they did it to me, late 1979, it was very standard for boys in the US back then. They told my parents I wouldn't feel anything, but he said he could hear me screaming from the other side of the building. It seemed like he'd been carrying guilt about it all these years, something he'd never mentioned until that day. Story 6 Approximately 2,100 children are reported missing every day in the U.S., or one for every 41 seconds. On the bright side, most will be returned unharmed. On the bleak side, the survival rate very rapidly declines over time. On the even bleaker side, in the cases of missing young adult men in the U.S., there's a fair chance a missing individual will be ruled deceased after a rather short search with minimal evidence. Even if no body is found, generally it's labeled as deceased due to natural causes, i.e. drowning in any nearby source of water, getting lost in any nearby woods, or just getting lost anywhere and passing away, after which the search is completely abandoned. The whole 48 hours rule is pretty disturbing. The mission goes from rescue to recovery terrifyingly quickly. Even though abduction is at the top of the heap for bad scenarios, it surprises a lot of people that a good portion of those missing kids are special needs children that literally just wandered off into the world and passed away somewhere alone. I can see why parents look into locators and other ways to keep tabs on their kids' locations. Story 7. The Romans used to punish people by having goats lick their feet. Goats like salt, so they would soak their feet in salt water. Eventually, the goat's tongue was rough enough that the skin would wear away and then you'd have a wound with salt trickling in. They would also remove the top two layers of skin and leave the third so you'd scab over, couldn't sweat, and since your body couldn't control its temperature, would slowly cook you until you perished. It sounds like the goats were also being punished if they were forced to lick feet. That image is just uh, disturbing. But dude, I have more stories about disturbing facts you had no idea about, so hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more. Story 8. If you were to put the entire lifespan of the universe, from the Big Bang to the final heat death, onto a 24-hour clock at the universe's current age, established 13.8 billion years ago, we would not have reached the end of the first 30 seconds. If you were to go into the far future, past the point where there are no more solar systems, the planets have either been destroyed or become rogue planets, where there are no more galaxies, everything either being swallowed up by black holes or being ejected from the galaxy, no more anything of normal matter due to proton decay and no more black holes due to Hawking radiation, even here, at this point, you would not have reached 12 o'clock noon on our universe's clock. The universe will spend most of its life as a dark, cold, empty void. You would be unlikely to find a single surviving subatomic particle in an area the size of the current observable universe, established 98 billion light years across, until the background temperature reaches minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273 degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin, at which point entropy wins, time becomes meaningless, and the universe remains in a cold, dead state for all of eternity. Story 9. According to the FBI, over 40% of slayings go unsolved, meaning if you get harmed, there's a pretty good chance the person who harmed you will not spend a day in jail. I think it's because most, or at least 40% of them, happen in the ghetto where nobody snitches. Cases go cold immediately. I also think about the likelihood of it being solved in the small town where I live sometimes. For example, say when 911 gets called after the discovery, it's not going to be some TV or CSI scene where the detective is like, Ah, but what do I see here? This hair is from a rare breed of Mexican cat that's only sold as one exotic breed pet shop. And then they go on to check sale records and track down the perpetrator. Here, it would realistically be more like our one and only fat cop shows up after about half an hour or so and just sort of bumbles around contaminating any possible evidence, not doing any good at all. And if by chance a larger department actually steps in to do some investigating, the scene would be garbage. I could people all damn day. Story 10. A vitamin D deficiency can make you depressed and deficiencies among adults are very common like more than 50% of the population in the U.S. Not just that, vitamin D deficiencies can cause so many different symptoms and problems that you might never expect or anticipate. 
My doctor says that where I live, they don't test for vitamin D deficiency. They just treat it because everyone here is deficient. I'm from Manitoba and I can definitely notice when I don't take vitamin D even in the summer. I find my mood generally gets worse when I lack vitamin D. There is definitely a fair dash of depression too. Everything kind of just goes gray, if that makes any sense. It feels like I don't really have anything to get out of bed for, nothing to smile for, and I'm more tired than usual for sure. Story 11. There are a grand total of 51 nukes that are missing all around the world, 40 Russian and 11 American. One of them is apparently half a mile off the coast of Georgia and the city of Savannah is within its blast radius. The lost Tybee bomb was named because it was dropped off the coast of Tybee Island, which is incredibly close to Savannah. We don't know if the bomb is actually capable of nuclear detonation because it might not even have a core, but then again, it might have a core and be able to go nuclear. We don't even know if it's still there. One fisherman claimed his net got caught in something a few days after the bomb was jettisoned. Some believed it to be the bomb. Another report says that the Soviets found it and took it instead. Most likely, though, it's there and just not nuclear capable. Even then, it still has a metric ton of conventional explosives in it that could go off and maul the area it's dropped in. The good thing, I guess, is that it's 100% not capable of exploding. Even if it were brand new, it wouldn't explode spontaneously because of a fire or because of a massive explosion next to it. They need a very specific timing of small explosives around it to compress the fissile material enough to cause the chain reaction. The length of the wire of each detonator is taken into account to program the chip that controls them. They won't explode by accident, ever. Even if a goon finds them, they're designed so you can't just hotwire them like a car. Chances are, even if a big government with a big budget finds one, they won't ever be able to use it without the codes. The worst that can happen is that regular explosives detonate in an uncontrolled manner and spread radioactive material everywhere. As comforting as the fact that those bombs are incapable of detonating is, well, man, just knowing that they're out there somewhere can cause serious damage is pretty damn scary. Story 12. The first face transplant was for an 8-year-old girl named Sandeep Kaur who got into an accident when her pigtails were caught in a thresher in 1994. After the incident, she went to her mother who called the neighbors and she was rushed to Malarkotla Civil Hospital. Her parents were able to get her face from the machine which they brought with them to the hospital. Sandeep claims that when the incident happened, she didn't feel any pain. Her face was just numb. The face replant procedure involved reconnecting blood vessels, veins, and muscles. The last parts involved reconnecting parts of the face like the eyelids and the mouth. The procedure, which took 10 hours, was a success. She had several other small reconstructive procedures after. She's now healed and is studying to become a nurse. Story 13. There's only one reason DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, is dangerous and is the model chemical for why you wear gloves around all solvents. DMSO absorbs straight into your body and into your bloodstream immediately upon contact. It won't harm you at all. It's completely safe on its own, although huge excess is probably not good. It's what DMSO might have in it. It dissolves both polar and nonpolar things like water or fats, respectively. So you could dissolve a totally harmless to touch chemical, which is only dangerous if it gets into your bloodstream in DMSO and never know. It also makes an effective delivery method for medicines that you can't eat, maybe because you're too sick to keep anything down, for example. Bonus fact, you'll know if you've touched DMSO. If it touches your skin, your mouth will immediately taste like garlic. You won't only taste garlic, you'll smell like garlic for hours. A common treatment for interstitial cystitis is DSMO mixed with lidocaine, which is then injected into your bladder via a catheter. You hold it for a while, then it gets drained out. An unfortunate side effect is that it can basically cause paralysis of the bladder muscles, forcing you to self-cath for a while until the muscles regain function. It took me two weeks before I could take a whiz without a catheter. It's falling out of favor for this reason. Story 14. The sun will cease to exist in about 5 billion years, but Earth will be habitable for only another around 500 million years, because the sun's luminosity increases gradually, turning the planet into a scorching rock relatively soon. More luminosity because the sun fuses hydrogen faster into helium over time. 
The sun's been about halfway through its expected lifetime, but has used up only 25% of its hydrogen supply. As the star's core grows slightly over time, more hydrogen fuses and more energy is produced, though the sun will never fuse through all of its hydrogen like fully convective stars like Proxima Centauri will. Thus, the sun becomes brighter and the Earth receives more energy, rendering it hotter. Higher temperatures will also comprise plate tectonics and carbon cycles, thus making photosynthesis impossible at some point before the temperature itself becomes fatal. Plus, the universe will experience heat death as space expands so much that even the most energetic phenomena are reduced to ghosts of ghosts until no matter of energy as we know it exists in a truly silent, dark, infinite abyss. Story 15. There's a type of planet called rogue planets that follow no orbit, so it is entirely possible that we have a Jupiter-sized ocean hurtling through space at 40 times the speed of sound, and we will likely never see one. There are also black dwarfs that are smaller than stars and are essentially white stars that have cooled over time. There may be twice the size of Jupiter, but they don't produce light, so we can't really see them. And there should be more of them than there are stars. Brown dwarfs, which are failed stars, do currently exist, as we discovered some of them, and they are just bodies massive enough to not be considered planets, but too light to start their own thermonuclear reactions and therefore be considered stars. Story 16. Up until the 1800s, dentures were usually made of dead soldiers' teeth. We learned about this a couple of weeks ago. They went through battles after they were fought and yanked teeth out of slain soldiers' mouths. They could get a day's wages per tooth if it was good. Apparently, major battles were just a boon for the dentists. I seem to recall that there was something of a glut in the market after Waterloo and over 25,000 teeth were taken from corpses. Also, animal teeth. George Washington's dentures were made out of carved hippopotamus ivory that was fitted with horse, donkey, and human teeth. That's straight up disturbing. What if the deceased soldiers haunt the recipient of those dentures? Story 17. So there's a type of mushroom that can grow on small bugs and control them. They're called cordyceps. It has hundreds of strains, including ones that can hijack ants, small spiders, and even tarantulas. If it's any consolation, mammal bodies are far too hostile for cordyceps to survive in. Although most insects and other non-mammalian smaller animals are vulnerable to cordyceps, although it would have to have an adapted strain to be able to incubate in its non-native animal of choice. Story 18. Rats can fit anywhere their heads can fit through. The rest of their body is collapsible and they have sort of hinged rib cages. I used to keep pet rats and you have to be careful with the bar spacing on their cages. The ferret nation cage is a very popular cage because it has huge doors and is easy to clean, but it has half-inch bar spacing that rats can easily squeeze through. There's a version with quarter-inch spacing for smaller critters. Another fun fact is that rats can sometimes restart their hearts up to 15 minutes after they've passed away. They've also grown more and more resistant to the most common type of rat poison, warfarin, which is a blood thinner, meaning that they've been adversely bred to not care about blood loss and have clotting pathways not dependent on vitamin K. Story 19. Due to fresh drinking water being so scarce on the Galapagos Islands, some bird species such as the Galapagos hawk or the Galapagos vampire finch have adapted by drinking the blood of other animals. Story 20. Blind people can still hallucinate if they suffer from Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is a common condition among the blind. Also, sometimes our brains will make us hallucinate on purpose as a reaction to a lack of stimuli. This is a reason why people claim to see things in the mirror, especially in dark or dim spaces, such as when playing ritual games like Bloody Mary. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you're going to enjoy what are some deeply unsettling facts that you know. Story 4 is so spine-tingling it's almost unbelievable. I'll see you in that video, and I want to thank you for watching this one.